growing up, when I was in high school, uh, it was in the period of time before the financial crisis. Uh, Ireland, in the period you know, 2005 to 2008, was one of the world's fastest growing countries, and it was predominantly driven by a booming, booming uh, housing market. And so everyone was making a huge amount of money. And I thought um, that I was going to join our family business, um, and our family business is actually um, being a doctor. So there was nothing to walk into, uh, but I thought from the age of probably four that I wanted to be a doctor like my, both of my parents. And um, that's the way that it was until I actually decided that it was a good idea to go into a hospital and see what it was all about. And I did that at age 16 and I realized I absolutely hate this. There is no way that I'm possibly going to be able to do this for the rest of my life. And that's a pretty damning thing, uh, life kind of change or change in, in expectations to happen. And to be quite honest, it completely took the wind right out of my sails. I had thought from age four, this is what I was going to do. All of my kind of uh, guidance, all my, my role models were all doctors. And, and I was, here I was back um, at square one. And that was deeply, deeply demotivating. But it was okay because Ireland was a booming economy. Uh, and so what I decided to do is I applied to go to, to business school and, and this, would be, this would be fine, right? I'd probably go into property or, or something like it, and, and, and this is kind of easy anyway. Uh, this is a screenshot on, on the bottom right. Uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to get the video up. We tried earlier. Uh, but this is what I did. Uh, I partied a lot, and I partied so much, I enjoyed it so much that actually we started to organize all of the parties. And so this is a screenshot here of a, a DJ called Calvin Harris, who's like a yeah, huge DJ all around the world, playing one of our parties. 1,500 people, a um, yeah, massive, massive uh, event. And this was like kind of the pinnacle of it. But we did a lot of parties. We, we, we were quite successful at it. And in the course of that time, um, I kind of realized, well, am I going to do this forever? Am I going to be that guy who's you know, 45, hanging around parties, trying to get people to, to come into their nightclub? And I figured not. But I was very fortunate uh, because I met these two guys. Um, so on the left is, is a guy called Daniel Bowman. Uh, on the right is a guy called Gavin Yates. So these two guys and a couple of others. And um, they had come up with this. So I was involved in a, in a stock uh, market society in college. I was, I was leading it at the time. And these guys had come up with a great idea, which was to actually um, get funds from investors and use the brain capital or the human capital in, in universities and use it to invest. So you guys may be familiar with this model. It's, it's pretty well defined in Yale and Harvard and these big universities endowment funds in the US. Uh, and so we came up with this, well they came up with it and, and asked me very kindly to join them as a co-founder in what then became Trinity Student Managed Fund. Now, uh, the basic concept here is we were taking money from Morgan Stanley, from Goldman Sachs, from Deloitte, from these big corporates who were looking for recruitment access to, to, to our campus. And rather than spend the money on um, big events, what we would do is we actually developed a charitable trust, put the funds into the trust, and organize students around it. And we expected we'd probably have 20 um, you know, econ or, or math majors um, organizing the fund. And in actual fact, it was much more, much, much bigger than we first thought. And in the first year, we had 200 people actively, um, actively kind of investing and, and, and researching stocks. On the other side, the proportion of capital gains were reinvested back into the university and funded um, underprivileged students to go to college. So we managed to get large-scale buy-in from a lot of the, the powers that be in university. And this kind of became a model for what in, again, remember Ireland at the time, things are not positive. In fact, uh, you know, this is 2009, 2010. Things are really not positive. And so this became kind of a model for, um, for what, was, what was possible if you put the, the right minds to it and actually um, garnered some, quite a lot of attention. So this is uh, myself and my colleagues here uh, down at the bottom. The, the guy at the front is actually the, the president of Ireland who came very kindly to open one of our events. And, and I guess what this, uh, and this guy here with, with the glasses uh, is actually my brother. Uh, and my brother now leads the fund. It's got 400 student members. And over the course of the last uh, five years, the applicants and, and those who are accepted into university, or into, sorry, into um, consultancies and investment banks in London has grown by like five or six times each year. Um, and what this showed me more than anything else was I went from me, remember, a deeply unmotivated uh, guy who was going into college at the height of, a, of an economic boom 
And I left college four years later to go and work with um, Morgan Stanley. And the big reason for this is because I, by luck or by, by chance, would manage to surround myself with people who are much, much smarter than I am. And I think that this is a very, very, very important thing that we can all do in, in thinking about business and thinking about kind of uh, furthering ourselves is find the five, I mean, there's, there's a very good theory called chimp theory, which is basically you are and you become the five people that you spend the most time with. And so I was very fortunate that the guys that I managed to spend a lot of time with uh, were much smarter than I am and, and basically taught me a huge amount in a very small amount of time. So I think that was a good transformative period in, in, in my life. Uh, and I moved to London to work with uh, a, an investment bank called Morgan Stanley. And this was in, I interned in 2011, which is when Europe started to collapse. And so all of the governments uh, had to be, not all of them, but a lot of them had to be bailed out by the European Central Bank. Uh, volatility was off the charts and I was on a trading floor and it kind of, we weren't sure if the trading floor was going to be there the next day. Uh, at the time there were actually London riots. Um, I mean the world really did not seem like a very healthy place. And if you think about the pyramid of an investment bank, all these powerful people and then there's me, right at the very bottom. And I thought this is a great place to start again. Uh, and. Um, Again, it's important to realize that banking as, a, as, a, as an industry was coming under significant uh, pressure. Margins were being compressed, stock market volatility apart from that summer was falling and so the amount of returns available to banks was reducing, uh, M&A activity was, was, was falling off um, and this was of course well known across all of the major newspapers all around the world. But the interesting thing about one of these uh, banks or these institutions is that there's a reason that they're so successful. And the reason that they're so successful is because the people that work there are very smart, and probably more than that, very, very hardworking. And I happened to find myself again with a fair amount of chance in a team uh, which was not focused on um, doing things which were not adding value to the bottom line, which was not focused on um, being involved in, in, in instruments or being involved in, in trades that ultimately were not commercial. And I was very fortunate to join a team which focused on one thing and one thing only, and that was coming in every day and doing the most that they could do in order to hit the very high targets that were set of them. Um, and they were very um, forthcoming in their support of me and, and, and in teaching me that actually it makes much more sense to sit down in the corner of the room and be very uh, focused on, on something which really adds value as opposed to is uh, grabbing headlines and is, is you know, the, the sexier parts of doing business. Because each and every quarter when we sat in the, in the, the meeting with the, the head of the, the trading floor, it was our division that was coming out on top. And actually at that time Morgan Stanley was doing very well in equities, was going from being number two to number one and is still number one now in equities. And that was driven largely by the business that I was in, 30 people which were contributing something like 40% of the revenues of the floor. And that level of commerciality, I think, and, and more than anything else, um, focus was ultimately, um, I suppose, in some way recognized this is a very um, uh, old screenshot, let's say, from, uh, from Morgan Stanley careers page where I was the, the featured analyst and that is actually just shortly before I, uh, I left. And so I was very thankful for the, the team there because what they thought, taught me more than anything else was just focus on the things which add value and forget about everything else. Because there are so many things which are pulling us each and every day to doing things which are often more attractive to do, easier to do, but ultimately don't give us the success at the end of the day. Um, and so that was really what I learned in my time in Morgan Stanley, which we continue to apply now. As an associate, despite being very grateful for the, uh, the team there, uh, I was given an opportunity to join a business. So some friends of mine came here in 2012 to set up companies uh, such as Lazada and Zalora, if you're familiar with those companies, uh, a whole host of other companies which um, a food panda, which I'm, I'm not sure is still here, but basically had, were the founding partners of a business called Rocket Internet and came here and went everywhere else in Southeast Asia to set up those. Would I leave Morgan Stanley to come and join them in their mission to kind of 
grow this business across Southeast Asia. So I did, I went to Hong Kong. And um, I think they knew this before they asked me to go to Hong Kong. But they only told me when I got there that actually um, I shouldn't bother getting an apartment because I should get on more or less the next plane to go to Manila, Philippines. So I was in Hong Kong for, for maybe uh, a month or two and then came, uh, came, to, came to Manila. And yeah, that was um, a very interesting time. I was 24 years old, had uh, left a job which was um, you know, paying very well, which was, uh, I lived with my five best friends in, in London, and the next thing I knew I was looking on Facebook and LinkedIn to see was there in fact one person in Manila, Philippines that I knew, and unfortunately the answer was no. But anyway, I was on a plane, uh, sort of like a week, a week later, and, and came to Manila. And what we did in our time here was we developed a business model. So this is now the Compare Asia Group across, across Southeast Asia. We developed a business model which allowed the Money Hero business to go regional. And so we started here in the Philippines, uh, went to, to Jakarta, uh, and, and also to Bangkok were the three markets that I was most involved in. And uh, you know, over the course of four and a half months, over the course of four and a half months, uh, we grew the business here to 70 people, uh, and over the course of eight months across the three cities, to 180 people. And that's only possible when you take all of the hours that you were given, and you stay awake, and you work for all of them, as hard as you possibly can. Maybe not all, but 110 hour weeks, easily. And what what the time, and I think that this is possible to do in a place where you actually don't have all of the distractions. It would be much harder for me to do that now because there's you know, lots of great things like this, this happening all of the time. But that, when you don't know anyone in a city and when your only reason for being there and being alive is to, to build a company, then actually you can throw everything at it. And what that showed me more than anything else was that in order to, um, in order to succeed in what you're doing, you have to be 100% uh, dedicated to it. And this is, I think, three months later, we've got about 40, 40 people. Um, and and we, yeah, again, we, we grew very, very quickly. And we didn't really know what we were doing a lot of the time. We'd never built a business of that, that size. And we were just learning as fast as we possibly could. We were doing you know, interviews in the morning. We were running the business in the afternoon. And then we were uh, finding people on LinkedIn to come and interview the next day or the day after. It was like that for, for a very long time. Um, we were successful in doing so. Goldman Sachs ultimately invested a portion of the $40 million Series A. And we then subsequently left shortly thereafter. Um, but the learnings that we took at the, in that time, and I think the contribution was, um, yeah, was, was one of the most developmental and, and interesting periods of my, my life. And I think that this is the third pillar which we think about all of the time, which is dedication. Uh, opinion, the biggest problem facing emerging economies, and actually not just emerging economies, but particularly emerging economies, is the lack of resource uh, available to small businesses. A whole host of positive benefits if you can solve that problem, uh, not least of which is a normalization of the income distribution curve, which is not possible to do unless you increase education standards or allow people the resource to actually do it for themselves. And we think that the second one is much more immediate and much more stable. And the size of the opportunity is enormous because it's very, very difficult to do. Right, there's a whole host of reasons why this has not been solved before, but we're in the age of mobile, we're in the age of the digital era, and that means that we have a huge opportunity to solve this problem. And if we do that, we will give small business owners the opportunity to grow their businesses, to hire more people, to strengthen their supply chains, and it has massive, massive knock-on effects. It increases political stability, economic stability, and overall, um, yeah, has, there's, there's nothing... There's no downside whatsoever. We take our focus, we do one thing, we do it very, very well, that is we enable small businesses to come to us and to get credit. It takes three days, so we've compressed a three-month journey with banks, and we do it in three days, and we're actually working with a lot of banks now to help them with our service. So it's not a competing product whatsoever. Um, and we, we do that by constantly reassessing what it is that we're looking to achieve, and we focus on the problem for the customer all the time, constantly, every day meeting, what can we improve today? And that's the only thing that matters, that focus, because ultimately, that's what adds value. That's what we know we can do well. I surround myself with people who are 
much, much smarter than I am. So I, Tony, Tim, Ben, and Vassal come from stellar backgrounds across Goldman, McKinsey, um, the summit involved in the World Economic Forum as well. And it takes this level of dedication, it takes this level of commitment and getting people with varied backgrounds looking at the same problem in order to come up, we think, uh, with the optimal solution. And ultimately, we are um, still 12,000 kilometers away from home. We still do probably 90, 100 hour weeks on average. We remain very, very committed, very dedicated to our cause. And so far, the results have been very promising. And, um, I thank you very much for your time today. I hope it's been in some ways interesting and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you.